Let's talk a little bit about the Longevity Escape Velocity Foundation. A lot of very interesting work was announced this time last year. Um, you've got your robust uh, mouse rejuvenation project. How, how's that coming along since we heard about it last? Well, I'm really happy about how fast. I mean, first of all, the main reason I am happy is by way of a correction to what you just said. It wasn't this time last year at all. Uh, you know, the foundation was really even soft launched before we even had a name just seven months ago at Longevity Summit Dublin in September. Um, so to have got this far that fast is something I'm very proud of. And honestly, I've taken some risks in order to do that. The work that we're doing at i Life Sciences, this extremely ambitious and audacious combination life, lifespan study um, in mice, is something that the time is right for. And there could not, I was not going to allow there to be any further delays on it. At SRF, um, three years ago, we initiated a kind of half heart well, I'm not going to, I think half hearted would be too much of an insult. It was a, a preliminary, um, uh, you know, toe in the water of this kind of thing, this combination late onset thing. Honestly, that, that's drifting now, I'm afraid. But um, the point is, it was always going to be on a very much smaller scale at that time than what we're doing now. So I feel, um, you know, the point is, we're getting to the point where things that um, actually demonstrate genuine rejuvenation, albeit perhaps modest, are out there. They've been, you know, uh, demonstrated by a very reputable and, uh, and you know, um, prestigious groups publishing good journals and everything. So we know that we can, to a large extent, um, trust that data. And that means that we can do what I've been looking forward to doing and combine those things into a single study and see how much they synergize uh, and so on. So, yes, so that study I wanted to get going without delay. And honestly, any you know, averagely cautious person would have waited a good three or four months longer than I did, um, just in terms of designing the study and making sure nothing would go wrong in terms of like delays to availability of reagents and things like that. So I took a few risks, but we've got away with it. Um, we started the study in towards the end of February, uh, uh, at most that were 19 months old. And We've hit a few minor speed bumps, but only minor ones. Um, we are, I mean, the people at ICOR, I mean, I just cannot praise them too much. They are just so professional, so good at what they do. Uh, and honestly, I knew they would be because they've done a whole bunch of these kinds of things in their capacity as a CRO. Of course, not on this scale, um, uh, whether, it, whether it be the number of mice or the complexity, uh, but still, they were... You know, they were definitely the go-to place in the world for this, and they have completely proven their metal, their caliber um, already. You know, I, 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 I'm just like, I'm just so happy that we had the opportunity to work with that group. Of course, Icor was one of our very early spin-out companies. Um, uh, I think 2013, actually, from SRF. And initially, they were just working on one thing, which is a project that we had nurtured at SRF internally on macular degeneration, but they branched out pretty quickly into the area of um, uh, being a CRO, uh, specifically focused on how, uh, on taking business from longevity companies and so on. And so they are perfectly placed for this. As regards the details of the study, I probably shouldn't spend time on that because it's obviously it's written up on our website in reasonable detail. Plus, I'm also posting updates every two weeks on social media. So, you know, that, that that's probably the best place to go for information that that kind. Yeah, great. Well, Aubrey, let, let's talk about the fact that obviously you know, tissue uh, engineering is going at kind of like a breakneck speed at the moment. And uh, we've talked before about the, the concept of what you're doing in cryo and talking about transplants on demand now. So could you maybe just expand a bit more on that work now? Because I understand that there's some, some new techniques that are coming out of this process as well, which would be very interesting to hear about. Sure, absolutely. So, um, of course, we all know that huge numbers of people die on waiting lists, waiting for organ transplants these days. <clears throat> why is that? It's well understood why it is, is that in order to um, give someone an organ that won't be rejected by their immune system or won't require completely unacceptable levels of immune suppression that would um, expose them to other things, infections, 
um, you have to transplant from a donor who is very similar in terms of their immune system. And um, that means that that person, uh, you, know, you need to wait for that person to, to die and become a donor. But worse than that, that person had better die fairly nearby geographically because when you take an organ out of an individual, whatever you do today, it's going to decay to a point where it won't actually work in the recipient in a matter of hours. Or a rather different number of hours depending on which organ, but still hours, not days, not weeks. And so, um, you know, if that were not the case, if that second part were not the case, we would be in an extreme extraordinarily different situation we would save the most immense number of lives uh if we could have organ banks you know of, of hearts and livers and kidneys and so on that um were of a diverse range in terms of um their immune status and therefore their compatibility with different potential recipients so how would we do that well of course the obvious answer oh, i'm going to say it's obvious is to freeze them you know to put them into um a very low temperature the same we do for DNA or stem cells or whatever, just keep them at minus 80 or minus something less, something more than 80, um, you know, to keep them at a sufficiently low temperature that chemistry stops, which means that, of course, um, decay stops and the organ can be used again. The difficulty is that freezing biological systems, but, you know, like such as solid organs, um, creates an enormous amount of damage to those organs um, over and above any damage that might already existed if, for example, the donor died of old age, right? <clears throat> so um, the idea is to reduce the amount of damage done by the freezing process. And um, 25 or so years ago, maybe 30 years ago now, uh, a group in LA led by the you know, world-leading uh, cryobiologist Greg Fay um, identified a rather elaborate um, common cocktail of cryoprotectants that would allow the um, or an organ to be um, frozen in a way that wasn't really, you know, they don't like to use the word freezing because freezing connotes the formation of ice crystals. And that's fundamentally the reason why it does so much damage. So the idea was that you would not have ice crystals. You would have instead solidification into an amorphous solid, a glass. And so this is a technique called vitrification. And that enormously reduced the amount of damage done by the freezing process, by the cryopreservation process. But you've still got a couple of problems. First problem is that these, um, these cryoprotectants are not completely non-toxic. They're not very toxic, uh, but you need to use them in humongous concentrations. So, you know, there's genuinely toxicity there. And the second problem is cracking. That when you, you know, thermal stress, you can imagine that when you've got something that you're taking down to, you know, a, a big temperature shift, and especially when you want to do it reasonably quickly in order to minimize the amount of chemical damage that I just mentioned, um, <clears throat> you've got... Um, thermal stresses that are going to happen, and you get cracks. The whole thing, like, you know, um, uh, breaks in, into many pieces, which is a little bit prejudicial to being transplanted into a person, right? Um, so um, what do we do? Well, I know of exactly one potential technology that shows really big promise in this area. And it's not really big promise, it's insane promise. And that's the technology that we're supporting at Kynice. Um, so it's called persiflation, and it involves cooling organs, not by putting them in cold temperatures just intact, but rather by pumping cold stuff, cold gas, through the vasculature, through the circulatory system. This way, you're not just cooling from the outside, you're cooling you know, throughout the thing all in one go, so it actually works better on large organs with a low surface-to-volume ratio than it does on small organs. That's completely new. Um, and this has... Um, you know, first of all, it, you cool so much faster that um, you've got much less toxicity for two reasons. First of all, you've got much less time for the toxicity to happen, for the chemical reactions to happen. But also, you've got um, the advantage that it turns out crystallization can be prevented with a lower concentration of cryoprotectants if you cool faster. That was known for a long time. And here we're, we're cooling an order of magnitude faster. 
I mean, it's not just, it's, it's not like, you know, second order. This is, this is big. So you know, this, this pretty much solves the toxicity problem. And on top of that, it solves the cracking problem. Because cracks, if you think about how cracks happen, they start somewhere. There's a kind of nucleation event, right? And then it propagates, right? The thing is, cracks do not propagate, at least when they're very small, they do not propagate through bubbles. So when they hit a capillary that's full of helium, right, um, nothing happens. You know, it just stops. So you don't get cracking. Now, helium is a point here. The reason why this is now, a, you know, a big deal is because of this innovation that was introduced. The idea of pumping gas through the vasculature, not necessarily for cooling purposes, for, but for other purposes, was first explored in the Soviet Union decades ago. Um, but using helium is particularly good for this cooling process, partly because obviously helium stays gaseous right down to like liquid nitrogen temperatures, but mainly because helium has very good solubility properties. It doesn't dissolve in, in, in water. So you don't have like problems analogous to the bends that you would have with nitrogen, for example. Um, and so, yeah, so all of this is, is, you know, theoretically, it's pretty much in place. Practically, um, the person who used to be my chief operating officer at Sense Research Foundation, Tanya Jones, has been working on this for several years, initially in collaboration with uh, a great technologist named Steve Van Sickle, who tragically died of COVID complications in 2020. Um, it was just really difficult to bring the um, investment in the door to uh, get this through and so her first attempt at a company in this area ended up failing a few years ago and we've just rebooted it with um uh with a new name and uh it's you know i have very high hopes for it obviously yeah wonderful Aubrey. so so kynice um is a uh, an independent company but supported by the foundation or how, how does that work from a corporate infrastructure and funding support perspective i'd just be interested to know how you approach it yeah so, sure so um my focus, obviously, is not making money. My focus is uh, getting the getting the best work done. And so, um, yes, we, we, we've just made a donation. I mean, they've given us, you know, a few percent of the um, company, but I didn't even ask for that, really. You know, um, as far as I'm concerned, this is not about, I mean, any any revenue that might come back to us would be in the relatively distant future. So it's really not something that I want to make decisions on the basis of. And it also helped that Tanya set up Kionice as a B Corp, uh, just you know, for tax reasons and so on. It makes it easier for non-profits to donate to them. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think about the corporate structure very much here. As far as I'm concerned, what matters is that the money that we've given them to get going um, is you know, seed money that will um, let them reach some milestones so as to have brought other money from other people who may be more, you know, investment minded uh, before our money runs out. Yeah. And uh, in relation to bringing this back to the summit, will Kai and Ice be presenting any, any results? Oh, you bet. I mean, I don't know in terms of results, but it doesn't really matter whether it's results or not. What matters is that the status of the company at that time will absolutely be presented, the case for it, the scientific case and the business case for that, for that matter. Um, yeah. So Tony will definitely be on stage. I can tell you that. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs>